My number eight best chess game of the 1930s is Aljekin vs. Lasker from Zurich, 1934. Now, in fact, we already saw a great victory by Lasker in this tournament, but the tournament victor was Aljekin. In fact, he scored an amazing 13 out of 15 points in this event. In general, the 1930s were an incredible decade for Aljekin. Even though he did lose a world championship match against Oiva in 1935, he was still dominant for most of the decade and won many, many brilliant games. It was hard to pick one game to focus on for this list, but for my money, this is the most smooth, instructive, and aesthetic of his many fine victories in the decade. Aljekin opens the game here with pawn d4, and Lasker responds with d5, and we get a queen's gambit here. Both players are going to play in natural theor theoretical ways that are still approved today. Pawn e6, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3, bishop e7, bishop g5, knight b to d7, e3, castles, and rook c1. Now, Rook c1 might seem a little odd to someone who's very new because it seems so natural to develop this bishop and castle. But if you develop the bishop, then black is going to capture on c4 and you need to take two moves to recapture. So Aljekin is trying to play useful moves like rook c1 and hold off, hoping that Lasker will capture here on c4 and he can recapture here in a single move. In fact, this hope is not ill-founded because Lasker did this in a previous round against Oiva, and he got a bad opening position as a result. However, he won that game. In this game, he is going to time the capture on c4 correctly and make Aljekin take two moves to develop this bishop, but even though he gets a good opening position, he's still going to lose the game. Chess is like that sometimes. The opening is not the only phase of the game that matters. C6, and now Aljekin says, all right, I don't see anything super useful that I can do, so I'm going to develop the bishop. I know you're going to capture on C4, which Lasker does, and I know I'm going to need to take a second tempi to recapture. Now, knight d5, Lasker is going for an exchange of minor pieces, knowing that he has less space in this position, so trades will help him achieve a better game, a more free game with the remaining pieces on the board. Bishop takes e7, queen takes e7, and by the same logic we just gave, we now don't want to trade more minor pieces if we can help it for white, so knight to e4, saying, all right, we've got one uh, trade of minor pieces on the board, this happened, but I'm not going to allow the trade of the pair of knights, so knight e4. Knight 5 f6, offering that trade again, and knight g3. Now, this position has been played hundreds of times, and the most natural move here is queen to b4 check, hitting this pawn and checking the king. And then white should play queen d2, and black can trade queens, and after the king recaptures, black can play rook d8, taking advantage of the placement of the king here. Now, you have a good game as black. It might look passive, but black has ideas to achieve c5, or maybe sometimes e5, and as a result, black does well in most of the games from this position, scoring just as well as white. Now, I have to think that Lasker probably knew this, but he doesn't go for queen before check. Why doesn't he go for this move? Well, I think the answer is tournament position. This is round 12 in a tournament that Aljekin would ultimately win with a score of 13 out of 15, so he's been leading the whole way through. If Lasker wants a really high place, even maybe first place if a lot of things go right, then he actually needs to win this game. And maybe his victory in a difficult position against Oiva had actually inspired him to hope for a little bit too much. In this position, in a, in a later position, he will also decline to trade queens when it made the most sense in the position. I think that indicates that he's playing for a win from bad positions and he is going to be punished for it. So here we get pawn e5, not going for the queen trade. And I imagine that Aljekin must have been very happy to castle here. Now, another critical decision. Do you play pawn to e4 or do you capture on d4? Well, Lasker goes for pawn takes d4, but maybe e4 is a little better, but still white gets a very strong position after knight d2. There's a lot that white can do here. This pawn is a little bit vulnerable, 
And there are also ideas, I think, of pawn to f3 at some point with proper preparation that could lead to a lot of pressure on the f-file. In any case, al would still be better in this position. But Lasker makes the capture here on d4. We get a small intermediate move at this point. It is knight to f5 hitting the queen, and we're just going to recapture on the next move. So queen to d8 and knight three takes d4. In fact, you could have recaptured in other ways and you could also have maintained an advantage, but al goes for this recapture here. And this produces an interesting and instructive open position. In fact, I've taught a lot of private lessons where I use this particular game to demonstrate how to play in open positions, positions that don't have central pawn tension, which often indicates a proper plan. So in a position like this, a lot of new players don't really know what the plan should be. Well, the key is piece activity, right? Especially of the major pieces. You need to try and play for the open files. So moves like this are really natural. You want to activate your major pieces, try to seize the open files, try to activate the other pieces as much as possible. In this case, d6 is a square that al is going to use for critical piece activity of both his queen and his knight in some moments. And then you want to prevent your opponent from doing these things as well. Try to restrict their pieces, use threats if you have the advantage to keep their pieces kind of boxed in, unable to compete with the activity of your pieces. And eventually, if you can find focal points for your attack, you want to turn things into an attack on the king or on critical weaknesses in the opponent's position where you might be able to win material and eventually win the game. So here, after knight three takes d4, we get knight e5, a good move. The computer thinks that bishop e2 is the best way to maintain an advantage, but bishop b3 is very natural. The bishop likes aiming at the f7 pawn, especially when you think that a knight might get to d6 to aid in that pressure at some point. Bishop takes f5 and knight takes f5. <clears throat> so at this point, we have a very critical position. A lot of newer players, especially if you're playing a great player like Al Yekin, one legendary for attacking play, might look to trade queens here, but this is going to leave black with a very difficult position because white is seizing the open file first, and although black can challenge, you just sink the knight into d6 with a clear advantage and you're pressuring all the weak points. I'm not saying it's winning, but it's very, very good for white. However, after knight takes f5, what seems to be best is g6. And this is a very computery move. And the computer thinks that black is actually equal in this position, which frankly surprises me. I, I would think that white should still be quite a lot better in this position, but I do have to trust Stockfish, even though I would still give a practical edge to white. The problem is this knight doesn't really have anywhere great to go. And as a result, White is really struggling to maintain an advantage. The best computer move is queen d4 here, a clever move taking advantage of the vulnerability of this knight, but there's a lot of game left to play. However, what we actually see from Lasker is a move that I think on a chess level is just really, really hard to explain. It is queen to b6. Now, I have to think that Lasker knew this move was bad, like really, really bad. This is the biggest mistake that Lasker makes in the game. And again, I think that the reason is that he doesn't want to trade queens because he really feels like he has to win the game. And it's just admirable fighting spirit, I guess. But by playing the queen to b6, where it really doesn't have a role, you're allowing al to just seize the center of the board, which he does with queen d6. This move is incredibly strong. The queen is a monster when posted here. She's also hitting this loose knight over here. And after black defends the attack on the knight on e5, white is going to seize the open d file. All of white's pieces are just crushing it in this position. And it's hard for me to believe that any master would think queen b6 was a good move. So I just have to assume that Lasker thought very, very optimistically about his chances to defend a really bad position here and said, all right, I'm playing queen b6, even though I know it's bad. So after queen d6, we get knight e to d7. 
uh, stepping back and now rook f d1. All of white's pieces are just really beautiful. This is exactly the kind of thing that you're looking to achieve in an open position, all of this piece activity. Rook a to d8, queen g3, a little threat here of checkmate. So pawn to g6, softening some squares. Once your pieces are active, try to create weaknesses and soft spots in your opponent's position. Queen g5 encroaching. Of course, this knight cannot be captured because the pawn is pinned. And king to h8. This move obviously doesn't make a very good impression, but it's really hard to find a good move for Lasker. I think this is an indication that he really doesn't know what to do, and he's really sensing that the position might be lost. Knight d6, hitting the f7 pawn, so the king steps back to g7 now that the knight is no longer controlling the g7 square. And there are a lot of great things that al Yakin could do here, but I really like pawn to e4. This is a nice, patient attacking move, you know, stepping up here, getting ready to bring the pawn to e5. Uh, this position is just overwhelming for white. Even though there's no way to immediately win material, Stockfish is saying that this is like plus three, and it makes total sense. All of White's pieces are amazing, especially the knight here, the octopus on d6, attacking all of the soft spots in Black's position. So here, after pawn to e4, we see knight to g8. This move recalls a little bit for me Lasker's move knight to e8 against Oiva, but this one is not going to work out as well. Rook d3, an excellent rook lift, and now pawn to f6. So once again, I can only say that, you know, this is a mistake, but there was no good move in the position. At this point, white can force checkmate in five, and I encourage you to pause your video and try to figure out how to do so. Well, al Yakin plays knight f5 check, pushing the king back into the corner. Don't forget about this bishop right here. The king cannot go to f7. And after king h8, the critical finisher, is queen takes g6, a very beautiful move, even if it's not too difficult to find. The threat now is queen to g7 mate. The threats are just absolutely overwhelming here. There's no real way to defend against the threats. For example, the square is many times under control. No piece can really successfully defend g7. And of course, the critical point is that if the queen is captured, there is rook h3 check. The knight can block, it's the only legal move and rook takes h6 is checkmate with the bishop and the knight assisting while the rook delivers the fatal blow on the h-file. I really hope that you've enjoyed this game. If you want to play open positions better, I encourage you to replay it multiple times. If you want to see more of my favorite chess games of the 1930s, then simply click on the playlist that is popping up on your screen as I speak.